Hey there, and uh, good evening. Uh, this is Black and Azul. I am Charles Wolin coming to you live here for episode number 45. Yes, 45. We continually uh, get a little older, as I like to say, and I'm here with the rest of our team uh, here coming to you from their uh, homes as well. Alex Morgan is with us. And you can find him on Twitter at Quakes underscore talk. And we, of course, have Jamin Moore with us. And he runs the website, the Quakes Epicenter. He is the editor-in-chief. You can find him at J Moore Quakes on Twitter as well. Um, before we get started, Joel Soria uh, was going to join us uh, this evening. Um, he uh, unfortunately had a, a bit of an injury on a, uh, on a bicycle uh, trip that he took earlier today. Um, he is doing okay, um, and uh, he will be back with the team. Don't worry, there's no internal struggle. We all love each other here. We talk to Joel on a daily basis or, or every other day. So just wanted to let uh, everyone and, and all the fans know about that. We were very excited to have Joel back with us uh, for episode number 45, but he will um, be joining us back uh, in, in, in the future here. Um, but let's get to it. We've got a lot to chat about as well. Um, the Quakes top their group. Um, Magnus Eriksson, there's some rumors about him um, and, and, and what that means. Um, and then the Quakes take on RSL uh, tomorrow. So uh, let's let's dive right into it. Uh, the Quakes top their group. Um, they uh, they go on to 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 face Real Salt Lake. They beat Chicago by a scoreline of two goals to nil. Cristian Espinosa, designated player and uh, record uh, club signing, uh, scoring the opening goal for the Quakes. And then Chris Wondolowski comes off the bench, does what he does best. But uh, we're gonna break it down for you, but. What does it mean for the Quakes to to win their group? Um, the reigning MLS Cup champion Seattle uh, Sounders were were in their group. They came from behind to defeat uh, the Vancouver Whitecaps, uh, and and they beat a Chicago team that was somewhat looking the part. They beat Seattle as well, Chicago. So, um, Alex Morgan, good evening to you. Uh, what does it mean for the Quakes to top their group and move forward here as as the group winners? Well, Charles, I think it means that they exceeded all expectations. Uh, this was a, a consummate performance for them. It was really well-rounded against Chicago. And they'll be thrilled to advance from the group stage in such a convincing fashion. I don't think any of us expected them to finish top of their group with, with seven points. And what's been super interesting to me about watching them in this group stage is how different each of their games has been. The Seattle game was super cagey. The Vancouver game was wide open. Uh, in this game against Chicago was very physical and super choppy. There were 33,000 total, 33, probably the most trigger happy referee I've ever seen. But I think that actually suited the Quakes just fine because uh, they were the fitter team. They, they won those battles uh, and they were able to settle into a rhythm whereas Chicago never looked super comfortable with the intensity of the game. Yeah, absolutely. So one of the first things that started off in this game is, was, it got really up tempo really fast. And I don't think that that was the type of game that Matias Almeida wanted to play. Keep in mind that the Quakes going into the game needed to get the right result in order to ensure that they went through to the next round. And, um, you know, while, while Matias did get aggressive at the end of the game uh, by, by subbing on attackers, um, you know, he basically uh, at, got them to, to try to quickly slow the game down. Uh, now a lot of a lot of fans online complained that that was boring, um, and indeed the the expected goals for the game uh, were was actually you know pretty small. It it was not the most exciting soccer for the first fifty some odd minutes until the Quakes got the breakthrough. But once they did, um, Almeida you know basically wanted to to choke him out and uh, subbed on the attacking unit because. He decided at that point, based upon his comments to me uh, in, in my post-game question to him about why he subbed on the attackers, he, he effectively said, I didn't feel that the game was in hand, and I felt by putting more attackers on, we could get the game in hand. Sure enough, Fierro to Wondolowski, 2-0. Uh, uh, Quakes keep the clean sheet. No surprise. Uh, we had a flow 
uh, Youngworth returning to the lineup for the first time this season as a starter, and uh, they got a clean sheet. Um, and uh, he, he was in place of, of Alanis, who, you know, I, I think it was a smart move, given his cramping and such, for um, Almeida to put some trust in, in Flo, to do what Flo did last season and bring some quality to that left center back position. And sure enough, did. Uh, and uh, and the Quakes, uh, the Quakes, I, I thought, just game managed. It was a classic Almeida, um, you know, a tactical move to slow the game down, control the ball, not give it to, to Chicago very much. And I thought it worked well. Yeah, Jim, and, and we had talked about last week about how Chicago played with a relatively high line and how the Quakes could use Espinosa's pace to exploit that in behind. And that's exactly what they did. Uh, for their for their opening goal early in the second half. Kashia played a long ball over the top to Rios, who had an excellent knockdown for Yule. And, and of course, Jackson found Espinosa running in behind with a really good through ball. Uh, it was a great goal. And I think given that Espinosa was shut down uh, so much by Seattle and Vancouver, it, it was nice to see him get back on the score sheet. Yeah, he, he just, he needs that confidence. He needs to feel like that he can use that pace. Um, and, uh, you know, things might be different for RSL. I don't expect that RSL is going to play that type of line that's going to allow the Quakes to get in behind. We, I think we know from last season what we can expect, and we'll get into that later. But, um, you know, it was, it was as you said, I, you know, the, the fouls. I, you know, my, my son was sitting there going like, okay, they set the corner record last week. Are they going to set a fouls record this week? Because it was really, uh, really uh, you know, very much a stop and start type game. But I do think that that was kind of part of the game plan um, all along. Um, you know, I've, I've, in my working with soccer coaches over the years, a lot, a lot of times when thing, teams don't feel that they can get the upper advantage on the attacking side, there's a lot of fouling that goes on and that's intentional. That's to disrupt the game plan of the other team. I kind of felt like it was, it was a bit intentional. Do we feel that the Quakes have gotten better in every game that they've played thus far in this tournament? And it's it's a bit of a kind of a square pundit type of opinion to say this, but mm -hmm. in World Cup situations or in tournament situations, teams that do get better in each and every game throughout the group stage and kind of coming in with momentum into the knockout stages and very much looking the part and then having pundits and media. Now we're starting to see that from MLSsoccer.com and other journalists across the country. Do we feel that the Quakes are in that box uh, in a way that they're, they've are they gained the momentum, that they've got better in every game? And, okay, all right, the Quakes, yep, yep, they're one to watch going into the knockout stages. Um, or, or does it matter if, you know, you win your round 16 game and then, you know, you get you you, you get the label? Charles, I think that that we saw a couple of different threads come together in this in this game against Chicago. Going into the Seattle game at, at the start of the tournament, it was about whether San Jose's defense could keep out goals. They had allowed seven goals in the first two games of the regular season. So that was the question coming into the, the Seattle game, and that's what they did. It was a scoreless draw. So then the question against Vancouver was whether they could score goals, and they did. They scored four goals. Uh, and against Chicago, they did both. They were really sound defensively, and they also put the ball into the back of the net. So in that sense, I think Chicago, the Chicago victory was definitely their their best performance of the group stages, uh, and, and that'll give them confidence going into the round of 16. Yeah, if if the move to bring on the attackers had backfired on Almeida, we might be having a different conversation, but because it didn't, um, it, you know, this time, um, you, I, I feel like... This was the first game out of five this year that Almeida was able to have a game plan, stick to the game plan, and be able to get the result that went with that game plan. Um, it hadn't happened in a very long time, probably since either the last Vancouver or Orlando City game uh, last season, where they, they won two before, uh, unfortunately, not winning the rest of the way. So, you know, it... it it was good to see this kind of result happen against a team that was not either named Orlando City or Vancouver. All right. Uh, we heard from Jackson Ewell uh, in the midweek press conference, and uh, we've got a lot of uh, clips to show you of Jackson. Uh, but first, would like to show you the clip 
of uh, Jackson Newell on the uh, Group B um, uh, winners uh, and his thoughts uh, on that. Uh, yeah, I mean, first, we were super excited just to be able to play together again. Um, you know, it's been been a long time since we've been a group. And so we got here pretty early to, to kind of be a team again. And the group stage was a lot of fun. You know, I think we had a lot of excitement and uh, for sure a little rusty at the beginning. Um, but I think, um, you know, as the games got on, we kind of um, found our stride again and, and were able to play play well. And, and it was just it was a good time just being out back on the field and um, competing with, with everyone again. Here's a lad that is absolutely loving his football. We talk about it week in, week out on this show um, and how Almeida has really turned um, uh, Jackson Ewell in, in, into a, a wonderful player, one of the top players uh, in, in this Quake side, if not the best player uh, in this Quake side. We could debate that. Um, but... Uh, you know, he, here he is just, just very confident, but very mellow, very chill, uh, saying, you know, Hey, you know, we're, we're, you know, having a good time, but this is also a business trip too. Yeah, absolutely. The, um, the thing that, that kind of comes to mind in these types of interviews with, with Jackson is, is just how he never gets too high or too low. There's always the next bit of business to take care of. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think it's showing a lot of maturity for a young player. Not going to surprise me if uh, if he, if he is, does stay around and doesn't go to Europe in the next couple of years, if we end up seeing him wearing a captain's armband at some point, because I think he's kind of mature beyond his years in terms of how Almeida's viewed him. Already last year, Almeida said he's the most improved player on the squad. Um, but I think that's not just from an Almeida perspective, knowing the way Almeida thinks uh, now uh, more than we did before. Um, it really it talks to to kind of I think where he feels like his maturity is, um, as well as his his playing ability. All right, let's go ahead and pull up the um, expected goals from the Chicago game, the, the XG chart here, um, and take a look at it. As you can see, Chicago had a, a little bit of a a higher percentage there, but um, Jamin, can you break down the probabilities here? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, as as already Alex mentioned, the ball in behind to Christian Espinoza was really the most, uh, one of the most important offensive moments of the game. Um, that's the ball that we talked about last week that they hadn't done all season. And then they were able to finally find a way to do it. Um, and yeah, the high, high line kind of gave that opportunity to them, but it's uh, it was an important important goal to see. Um, and then, of course, uh, the opportunity to Chris Wondolowski. You know, you give him that much room, uh, and you give him a ball to his head, and the chance that he's going to miss, you know, is 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 pretty low. Um, when we do the expected goals models uh, in American Soccer Analysis, headed balls always get. Uh, a lower percentage than footed balls, but I can't imagine a scenario in which uh, Chris Wondolowski doesn't put that type of, of opportunity in the net. Look, look, Jamie, you put Chris Wondolowski on the field and you get goals from crosses. I think it's as simple as that. His movement, his awareness, his finishing, they're some of the best in MLS, but, but we knew that, right? He's shown that 161 times now. So that's, that's how many goals he's scored in, in Major League Soccer. What stood out to me in this game uh, and, and in this tournament is how well he's taken to the super sub role, how, how he's able to come in in that last half hour of the game when everybody's legs are more tired and when there's usually more space uh, and how he's able to exploit that. To me, that shows that he could absolutely continue playing in this league for another year and, and continue to score goals for this team. At the beginning of, la uh, of this year, sorry, he said that this would be his last season for the Quakes, but but now he's softened that position a little bit in multiple interviews in the bubble. Uh, he's he said that he's going to reevaluate again at the end of this year. So I think there's a, a good chance that we could get to see a 38-year-old Chris Wondolowski playing in, in 2021, which is truly remarkable. I think I said this last season, but you know, uh, given that he he has said that he wants to be in the academy and wants to uh, to you know kind of further his career from a coaching side. Um, to me, like next year would be a great like player coach type season where he spends a lot of time really kind of with the coaching staff, kind of learning um, the philosophy and such. 
uh, before he goes really kind of full time into the academy. And, you know, he does these little 30, 20 minute stints where he can come on and provide that type of, you know, energy, if, if not from from pace like other players can, like Shea, um, but just from his ability to move in the box and to continue to educate the the other strikers in the team. Jamin, in, in, in my ideal world, I think he'd do some media cameos as well next year. <laughs> Get behind the mic. He has to. Uh, you know, we, we have chatted about this and he is going to be a phenomenal coach when he decides that he wants to do that and step out and, and, you know, be able to, to mentor young lads and, and be able to, you know, show them the way of major league soccer, which, you know, he is on that Mount Rushmore of major league soccer. I mean, you're talking about the greatest goal scorer in the league. Uh, and, you know, obviously it would be nice to have, fans in the stands for a testimonial or to see him in competitive matches uh, for sure. Uh, you know, what I thought was interesting about that was the Carlos Fierro cross and, and Matias Almeida always trusting in Carlos Fierro coming off of the bench as one of his wingers as well. And I think one of the talking points here that we've chatted about so often and, and for fans is about this Carlos Fierro character. Is he going to come good? Is he, is he going to get that little carrot here and there where he, you know, shows a little bit of silver lining uh, of some of his quality and obviously the cross. Yes, it did. But is there more is the question going forward. I, I'm not sure, but at the same time, uh, it was nice to see a, a, you know, a second choice winger that has, you know, his pedigree that has his, um, that, you know, has his accolades, uh, finally be able to produce because the jury's been out on this guy for a long, long time. And I think, you know, we, you know, there's been a short leash on him from the from the fans, but for Almeida, he trusts him, and it's always one of his first, second, or third guys he puts out on the pitch, um, uh, you know, off of the bench. And so, you know, I thought it was a decent performance from him too, um, and, and perhaps might do something for his confidence. And I've said this before: confidence is key for a player like Carlos Fierro. He needs it. He needs every single piece he can get. Um, because uh, Matias Almeida is giving him the chances here in San Jose. Yeah, this this is something he needed. You had the right word there, confidence. It, if this doesn't propel him up to bigger and better things, if um, if we're now you know going another you know five to ten games before Carlos Fierro comes up with either a goal or an assist, um, it's not happening quickly enough. And uh, you know, let's. Let's see if uh, if this is just a confidence thing and if that type of assist will give him that that level of confidence he needs. I, I think it might go beyond confidence, though, Jamin. I, I, I think he's just not the player that we expected. He doesn't have the pace. He hasn't shown the pace, and, and nor has he shown the incisive runs, incisive passing, and, and the finishing that we've seen. So at, at this point, for me, the, I think the, the jury's already in, the verdict's in. Uh, and and it's a negative. All right, let's move on here and um, pull up the quote here from Matias Almeida on uh, advancing to the next round to play against Salt Lake. Um, he says, I think that in the round of 16, this is one of the worst teams to face, a team that is compact, strong in the defensive line with many quality players who make a difference. They are good in the air. They have their own style and they know what they play. I think it will be a very difficult game and we will see if we can figure out their virtues, their defects, and from some place be able to overcome them. We have played them twice, uh, excuse me, we have played twice against them and they have been difficult games. This game, because of where we, we are at and uh, what we're playing for, will be another game. We always respect each opponent. We value them, but we obviously want to move on to the next round, and hopefully we will be up to that level. Uh, more on the Salt Lake preview once we get into it. Um, but here's the manager showing a, you know, a little bit of his hand saying, you know, last year, punch, uh, excuse me, punch, uh, counter punch, um, and uh, it's going to be a hard game um, against Salt Lake. 
um, it, it's going to be a battle. Um, and, and we respect this opponent and we move forward um, just the way that we've been doing it, just like a regular game, even if it's a Western Conference foe. Um, we'll go into the history of the rivalry and what we had last year in a little bit in the preview. But here, here's what he had you know, to say in, in the, his press conference. Yeah, it you know RSL is is for sure going to be a difficult opponent. I I think a lot of what we kind of saw in the Chicago game will apply to RSL, except they won't they won't give that space in behind. They did they didn't get it last year. They're not going to this year. RSL is one of the stingiest defenses in the league. Um, if I remember right, I think they've only given up three goals so far this season, but they've only scored three. So yeah, we'll we'll, we'll get into this a bit later. But it's just a um, it's it's going to be a, a probably a fairly ugly game we can expect. All right. We will get into it a little bit later, but we want to move into chatting about Magnus Eriksson. Uh, reports out of Sweden suggest that Magnus could be on his way um, from the Quakes. Um, lots of different stories um, about that. Um, but he could be headed back to uh, you. Gordon's is the the pronunciation. We looked up the pronunciation. I, I don't know if I got it correct. My Swedish isn't too brilliant. But um, Alex Morgan, um, you've done a lot of research on this story, and and, and it, it has been developing throughout the week in many facets. But what is the latest, and, and what can you tell the rest of the fans? Right. So, Charles, this isn't the first time that we've heard this rumor. Uh, Magnus has been linked with, with your garden. And he's been, he's been linked with them on and off for the last year and a half. And that's because your garden are her, his old club. He played there for two years before he joined the earthquakes. And he was the, the joint top, top goal scorer in the uh, Swedish first division in 2017 uh, as a part of the your garden team. Uh, so this, this last February, their director of football, uh, Bosse Anderson, he had been quoted in a Swedish newspaper called football direct as saying that something might happen this summer. So he's been on and off in talks with them for a while now. What, what was reported this last week, first by Sport, Sport Express in, in Sweden, is that Jorgarden have now offered him a contract and they could strike a deal as soon as July 29th, uh, which is in three days when, when the Swedish transfer window opens. Uh, and that's because Ericsson and Jorgarden want to make it happen as soon as possible. Uh, through my sources, I was able to confirm that Ericsson is in the last six months of the earthquake contract. We, 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 I think we more or less knew that. We're, we're able to guess at that, uh, which, which means that he's now allowed to negotiate with other clubs and that he is in fact looking to secure a new deal this summer. I, I wasn't able to confirm personally that he, he is in talks with your garden, but, but Daniel Christofferson, who is the reporter that broke the story at, at Sport Express, and he's a really reliable source. Uh, and then the, the football director for your garden was quoted in another paper, Football Direct, confirming that they're interested in him. So I think I'm willing to take that as fact at this point. The one new piece of information that I've learned uh, and that I reported on Twitter earlier this week is that Ericsson does not have a current offer from the Quakes. Uh, I don't believe that was reported in the, in the Swedish press. I think that's new. Uh, so that explains why he's trying to wrap up a deal elsewhere. Uh, at this point, I think the only thing that stands in the way of a transfer is the Quakes because they have them under contract through December. Now it's possible that Ericsson could sign with your garden now and then leave once he's out of contract with the Quakes, but your garden could try to buy out the remainder of his contract or offer some cash a transfer, me, a transfer fee to make it happen sooner. And if I were Jesse Fiorinelli, I actually think that that might be a pretty sweet deal because the Quakes paid quite a lot of money for, for Ericsson. He was their club record signing back in 2017. I think it was a little over a million dollars. So this seems like a great opportunity to recoup some of that money. Uh, now it's it's true that Ericsson has been the club captain and he's an important part of this Quakes team. And under no circumstances do I imagine that he would leave before the end of this tournament. But we don't even know if there's going to be a regular season or what that's going to look like in the fall. So I'm not sure it would be worth it to try to hold on to him until December anyways, if the Quakes have already decided that they're not going to renew his contract. Yeah, thanks, Alex, for that information. He, you know, there's um, there's a question here about what the Quakes would, what I think, pay for him, or what? Uh, I, how do you say it? you, Gordon? Is it a, how did I do there? Okay. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Mm -hmm. All right, you Gordon. How much? How much yeah. do they pay for him? Well, 
yeah. keep in mind that if they can be patient, they can get them for for free, right? There's there's going to be no transfer fee. So the question is on their side, how impatient you know are they for Magnus Ericsson services? What are they willing to offer the Quakes? And is that something that Jesse Fiorinelli uh, and the front office will think that that's good value in order to give up Magnus mid-season? Now, you're right, uh, Alex, we don't know exactly what's going to happen, but this week, uh, The Athletic revealed that they're looking at a, a extended you know, season that would start uh, right around, interestingly, I think right around uh, the time that the secondary transfer window opens. So let's say that the Quakes go on another game or two in the tournament and then they're out. There will probably be, you know, a, a week or two at least between when their last game is played and when the season would start back up. And a lot of that time does overlap with the secondary transfer window, if I remember right. So if there's going to be a move, it probably would happen in, in that time frame. Now, if if the Quakes think that they're not going to get him back, I think you said this, Alex, in my mind, getting something for Magnus versus nothing for Magnus is always preferred. The other thing that Magnus leaving does is it uh, brings up a, um, it opens up a designated player, uh, sorry, not a designated player, international player slot, right? And by opening up an international player slot, what we what might be able to happen is uh, Jesse Fiorinelli had said before that he wasn't able to do some of the things that he wanted to do uh, due to not having a slot available and also because a couple of the visas that the team were looking to get taken care of, a couple of the green cards, sorry, that the team was looking to get taken care of weren't able to happen because of, of the COVID-19 shutdowns in various countries. So that tells me that there's something that he has in mind that he would like to do. And the possibility may exist that by moving Magnus, it would give him the opportunity to do it. Is that the young DP 10 type player that, you know, has been rumored and maybe Jesse somewhat alluded to in our preseason conversations with him? Maybe. But bringing somebody in and getting them up to speed and slotting them into Magnus's spot, that could be a different question. And look, I, I think that Magnus has served the club really well. He's Mr. Consistent, uh, and he's been a, a great performer these last two years. But I would also keep in mind that he's 30 years old at this point, so his upside is minimal. And I think that means it's probably the right time for the Quakes to move on. And, and let's bear in mind, he's a, he's a journeyman player. He's played at 10 different clubs in four different countries over the course of his career. And he's never stayed anywhere more than three years. So to me, it's, it's not surprising that he's already set his sights uh, somewhere else, uh, especially a club uh, where he's had so much success in the past. Uh, and, and as you say, Jamin, I think the Quakes can do more with those resources, the international spot and the cash. Yeah, Magnus Eriksson, the the captain of this this team, and you said it yourself, Alex. You know he has not stayed at a club uh, for more than three years. This is his third season uh, with the San Jose Earthquakes. Uh, if if you look at his um, resume, uh, that is the case, um, and and that is that is the fact. Um, kudos to Matias Almeida for being able to get the best out of this guy. I mean, he, here's a player that we've chatted about so many times, um, and, and chatting about the number ten position that they should be flashy and they should be scoring goals every game, and um, and uh, you know, being able to lay balls off left and right and take players on one v one um, in, in the number ten position, but he he's a guy that's just a hardworking player, uh, extremely consistent, as you had said, uh, Alex, and just kind of just gets the job done. Um, and first on the team sheet uh, for for a reason for for being consistent, and he 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 trains well, and Matias Almeida likes him. Um, I think it's a win win either way here for the Quakes. The Quakes get to either put Vaco into that position uh, or another player on the roster or be able to open up that international player position that you had said, uh, Jamin, and bring somebody else in. Um, and Magnus Eriksson also gets a chance to move on um, and the Quakes be, a, a, you know, are able to get some money for him. Um, but I think all fans can mostly agree that he's, you know, served the club well. Um, done a decent job in the role, 
um, and has had some good performances under Matias Almeida. So either way, it's a it's a win win, um, you know, for uh, for this uh, for this Quakes team. Whether they sell him, uh, whether he goes on a free, um, or um, you know they're able to replace him um, with with other players. Jesus Solorio says we have his replacement in the club already. I think you might be referring to Vaco, but I'm not sure. Um, our friend Akash Saxena writes, Erickson's a great leader, but his playing style is counterintuitive to what Almeida does. I'd move Vaco to the 10 and play 4-4-2 where we don't need a 10. Uh, Joel Velez, he, he, his comment was up here again, but I think it begs the question, not only would we need a replacement for him, but would ownership spend the money for someone given their previous record and no money coming in due to COVID? That is a good point there. Uh, Joel, uh, football monkey, once again, if Magnus leaves, uh, we would need to look for a replacement at the 10. I don't see a suitable replacement in the roster uh, right now. Um, and squad horizon. Um, and I think it's, I think it's Devin and he writes, he should go. We get good money and sign a better, um, central attacking midfielder with that money. Um, please uh, chime in folks. Keep chiming in about Magnus Erickson. I know that there's a lot of opinions about, um, about, uh, the number 10 position and Magnus Erickson and, um, his position as club captain. So, uh, keep chiming in, uh, here, and um, we, we, you know, want to be able to to talk about it, but definitely some movement um, in the in the Magnus uh, in the Magnus camp here. Um, but let's let's chat about potentially having a, a player such as uh, Vaco maybe moving into uh, that position. Does you know it or someone else on the roster if that would if that would be the case. Um, but um, where do you know we stand uh, with another player on the roster uh, coming back uh, in, in into that position? And before I go to you, Jamin Moore, because I know you have a lot of uh, you know statistics and data to show us of, on the comparison of the number ten uh, spots um, of Magnus Eriksson versus other teams. Um, Alex, do you think that there's a player on the roster? Do you think they're going to have to buy another player uh, to be able to to get a, a good uh, body in that number 10 spot? I think they're going to have to buy another player, Charles. And here's why. Vaco could theoretically fill that role uh, for the remainder of the season, what's, what's left in the regular season. But he's out of contract at the end of the year. And I don't think that the Quakes are going to renew Vaco's contract. So this offseason will be a transitional year for them anyways. Danny is going to be out of contract. Uh, Vaco is going to be out of contract. Magnus is going to be out of contract and more. Uh, at least we suspect. Uh, there's a really useful resource that, that Colin Etnayer uh, of Quakes Epicenter runs on the, on the Quakes Epicenter website. It's a, a salary budget spreadsheet, uh, and he, he frequently updates it. So those are our best guesses. So from what we can tell, it's going to be a transitional year. So I don't think that the next year's number 10 for the San Jose Earthquakes is currently in the roster. I think they're going to have to splash some cash over the offseason and, and sign someone. Yeah, there's a, there's a good chance of that, um, Alex. So one of the things that, that I wanted to do, and, and I, I let a, uh, a couple of you know that I was going to be uh, doing some uh, some charts here. So I wanted to take a look at the current contributions of Magnus Eriksson because when you're looking at replacing him, you have to you have to understand the the level of contribution he's bringing to the team. And if you put anyone else in that spot, here's the shoes that they need to fill in order for the team to be able to maintain the same level. Uh, now we're going to look at mainly the passing part of it. We're going to bring back the conversation from last week about uh, progressive passes. So if you if you got to see our episode last week, we used uh, progressive passes to show what the Quakes needed uh, to improve on um, in order to get back to the type of offense that they had last season or to be able to, to get to a higher level within the league. Um, and Magnus Eriksson actually provides the biggest percentage of 
the progressive passing uh, within the team. Of course, that kind of makes sense. He's he's the number 10. So first, let's compare uh, Magnus and Jackson Ewell. Uh, and we've got a we've got a chart with a side by side here. Okay, so let me orient you to what you what you're seeing in front of you because you're going to get a couple more of these charts. So um, what you see here in the green is those are key passes. Key passes are passes that lead to a shot. What you see with orange arrows are the pass before the key pass, or uh, the, the best term I found out there is secondary key pass. So so just to keep it short here, I call it key pass two. Okay, and then uh, underneath that, you'll see a little bit of light uh, blue and some gray, which is either there was no key pass resulting from the progressive pass or the pass itself was unsuccessful. So now we take a look and we see, well, what percentage of a player's passes are progressive? Uh, in Jackson's case, 6% is, is the number. In Magnus's case, 9%. And we already kind of know that this is probably the case. Uh, Jackson helps him move the ball side to side before he kind of hits his... Uh, uh, long balls out usually to the wings. Uh, Magnus is a bit more direct in his play. He likes to go forward and look for opportunities to do so. He did that as a winger. He does it again as a 10. Uh, they both complete about the same number, although Magnus gets quite a few more opportunities to be able to do this. And you can see the level of contribution that Magnus has as compared to Jackson when it comes to progressive passing. Uh, 26 key passes compared to 11. Uh, 2.7 expected goals compared to 1.3. Um, and then on the secondary uh, key passes, you know, Magnus has twice as many of those as Jackson. If you take a look at where these passes are happening from Magnus, they are, a lot of those are going on in that right side of the box with, of course, you can guess, um, it's Christian Espinoza, who's on the receiving end of a lot of those passes. One of the things that the Quakes like to do is have Erickson slip a through ball in behind the defense, even once they get to the box and have um, Erickson try to, uh, I'm sorry, uh, have um, Espinosa try to run in behind and then hit that type of cutback pass that he likes to hit. Uh, that's not something you see Jackson really trying to do because Jackson is, is largely staying uh, more in the middle of the pitch. Um, but uh, you can see there that Jackson's not really a progressive passer per se. He's more of a, a deep lying distributor and uh, although he did get that uh, to progressive pass uh, through to um, Espinoza in the last game, that's not something that happens uh, all that often for him. Okay. Now, the question is, how good is Magnus Eriksson compared to the rest of the league? Now, one of the things we've heard us say on the show is that he's probably a B, B plus, sometimes B minus uh, player, but he is in the top half of the league. And I wanted to test that theory a little bit more. And so we actually put together a chart, and you're going to see four of these now. And I, I picked a few people. So, oh, sorry, you know what we're missing here? We're missing Magnus. I got uh, Fiddy Martinez on there twice, so I apologize for that. But let's take a look at uh, Nico Ladero, uh, Pity Martinez, Escanzalo there, in case you didn't know his real name, and Alejandro Pizuelo. So you can see Nico Ladero has about the same number of attempted, about the same uh, completed percentage. He, he does a bit more than Magnus. He's got 23... Uh, key passes, five goals, but only three on the expected goal side. So they've been a bit lucky with some of Nic uh, Nicoladero's passes. So he's really about the same as Magnus. Um, and, you know, it, it, probably if you ask the average person, would you rather have Nicoladero or would you rather Magnus Eriksson? Probably most people would say Ladero. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I talked with a uh, uh, someone who is an observer in ASA uh, of the um, uh, of the Sounders, and he's like, well, the, the, the thing with Ladero is he kind of like is hit and miss. He he tries big passes and sometimes they come off. And when they do, he looks brilliant. And when they don't, he looks like he just he just got had by the defense. So he's kind of this uh, boom and bust type passer. Um, Pity Martinez, I think, as we all know, has not lived up to what people have said he was going to be when he joined the league. Um, in his case, uh, you've got a little bit better expected goals than Magnus on the key passes side, but not quite the same on the key passes two sides. So he actually doesn't even complete as many progressive passes. Now, we talked about Pasuelo last week, and you can just look at that chart and see what he does. He just plays the ball in behind, in behind, in behind, and he's got guys that can run onto it and do well. Um, his uh, his uh, you know, expected goals is 6.3 on key passes. On secondary key passes, they're 3.4. He is the probably the best progressive passer in the league, bar none, and that includes Carlos Vela. 
um, uh, Alejandro Pozuelo is a, is a special type of player. So this is the type of production that you are looking for from your number 10 in MLS. Now, a lot of leagues are moving away from number 10s, but not so far in MLS. Almost every team that is considered a, a top team in MLS has a 10 and has a high quality 10. And that's the type of production that you need to replace. So I have one more chart, so bear with me, um, uh, which is uh, going to be a look at uh, Christian Espinoza versus Vaco. Now, you know, I've taken a look at Vaco from uh, in 2017 and in 2018, where he was a little bit more sensual. There is a bit more there, but um, but you can see Vaco is not a progressive passer. I think we would all agree that he's a dribbler and he tries to progress the ball through dribbles more so than passes. And this is going to be, I think, the problem with trying to put him into the 10 position. Um, and if, unless he can be really crafty on the ball and evade defenders, um, it's going to be really difficult for to see that he's going to move the ball faster than Magnus does. And, I, and people, a lot of people say that Magnus plays slow, granted. Um, but at the same time, there's a quite a big output there that you get from Magnus that uh, that Baco on the dribble is probably not going to exceed. So if he is your number one option to replace Magnus Eriksson, I think the Quakes are going to be in for kind of a rough second part of the season. And so, Jamin, do you feel that the Quakes need to be able to spend and replace that number 10 position, similar to what Alex had, had said there? Yeah, I think there's some, you know, interesting options that, that fans have tossed out there. And I think they're all worth considering, you know, can you put Rios at the 10 and put Wando or Houston in front of him, right? Um, you know, can you, uh, you know, do something uh, kind of interesting, like move Jackson Ewell up and uh, give Flo some more playing time, maybe as a central midfielder again? Um, that's been thrown out there. Um, you know, can we see Jack Scahan or can we see uh, one of these other young guys in Eric Cavillo or somebody else uh, step into that role? Um, Matt Doyle threw out there um, Fuentes. Uh, the problem is Fuentes is not on the current trip. So if you're going to go from MLS's back and immediately try to live life without um, without Magnus Eriksson, I think you're going to have kind of a problem throwing Fuentes out there because he's not really going in a position to have gelled with the team so far this season. He was an interesting uh, idea and option, but I think it's just going to take a while uh, for him to kind of grow into the season at this point, uh, not having been part of this this tournament and and all these uh, important team building things that have been happening uh, in the bubble. We see a little bit of uh, Rios's name coming up quite uh, quite abundantly in the in the chat here um, from um, from our friends um, Joel and Jesus. Um, but, uh, you know, Rios has been such an interesting player going from, a, a into that number 10 spot off of the bench and then becoming the starting striker at that number nine position. Um, and, and you know, is there a, is there a chance that he could be the, the replacement off of the bench? What do you think, Alex? I think he could be a, a temporary fix for the remainder of the season, but I don't think he's a, a permanent fix. And for this reason. It's because he's better playing, in my opinion, he's better playing with his back to goal. He's, he's better holding up the ball and distributing it. He did that really well against Chicago uh, for their San Jose's opening goal, their first goal. He took down uh, a long ball and played it right to Jackson Ewell. He took it down in his chest. And that's the role I see Rios playing in this team, where he could help this team the most, is in that sort of inverted number nine role where he's doing a lot of hold up play and then getting in the box as well. But I, I don't think that he is as fluent uh, with the goal in front of him facing the goal. I don't think yet he is, he is the permanent choice uh, to replace Erickson in number 10. One of the things that these charts obviously focus on is progressive passing, but you have to think defensively of what Magnus Erickson currently does for this team. He's pretty tireless in the kind of the the, the 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 second line of pressure type press where he's he's picking up based upon where Rios goes. And, and you heard, uh, if you were on our show like about three weeks ago where we had Bobby Warshaw on, um, a lot of what Magnus does is plays off of what the striker does. So if the striker goes and, and presses on a particular, you know, uh, center back uh, or whatnot, that decides, you know, what uh, 
what Magnus Ericsson is going to do. So whomever it is, it needs to be somebody who, who has a high enough work rate. We know what Almeida values in that position. It's a high work rate. And there has to be somebody with that level of work rate. And that's my probably my biggest concern with Baco is I think the, the Quakes are going to lose uh, quite a bit on the, on the defensive work rate side at that 10 spot. Now, we know that Almeida is open to trying it. He did it for the first two games of the season putting Vaco in that spot. But I think defensively, we saw the results of those two games. And one of the things that we were cautioned by some of the players is that, you know, don't put it all on the center backs. A lot of these these things happen because of failures up the field. And, and it's not the defenders saying that. It's the strikers saying that. If we don't do our job defensively, the center backs, we're putting them in an unmanageable position. And some of those goals are on us, not on them. Uh, I think Wando said that to us last week. So, um, you know, it's a it's a really important role defensively in Almeida's scheme, and the team is going to be much easier to pick apart defensively if they don't have that type of work rate player in that spot. Now, can I think Rios can do that? Um, I think he is that type of work rate type player. You know, this would be a perfect place for someone like a Quincy Ameriqua, quite honestly. Um, and, you know, with that level of work rate, but um, you know, I, I you know I'd love to see. I'd love to see the uh, the one of the younger players get the shot to do it. Just the question is, are they are they ready for it? Joel Velez says maybe Rios as a uh, central attacking midfielder and Danny as a true striker. Uh, Jesus Solorio says I like Danny Rios' idea, but Rios provides the defensive support that is needed in the. Uh, it, in the Almeida system. Akash Saxena writes, I don't think Rios has the mobility to play um, as an attacking midfielder. His movement uh, worries me. There's a little back and forth here with Joel. He says he thinks he would. I honestly uh, don't like him as a striker. Uh, you often see him playing low as a central midfielder. Jesus Solorio on the Jack Skahan uh, train there. Yet to see Jack Skahan, but he did perform well in the uh, preseason as well. Um, but let's move on. Let's let's talk about another cog in that midfield engine room. Somebody that we like to talk about, just the one name, and it is Judson and what he provides as that deep lying defensive central midfield player. Um, Tom Marshall, our colleague uh, for ESPN, said that he is the Angolo Conte uh, of uh, Major League Soccer, um, and. Um, you know, I don't disagree. I really don't. Um, but let's hear um, from uh, Jackson Ewell on how he has flourished uh, with having Woodson uh, be able to uh, pick out the tackles and be able to run uh, in between the center backs um, and um, and and uh, help the midfield uh, engine room uh, tick. Um, he's just a just a great attitude on the field and off the field. I think he brings. Bring just such a great work rate to the, to the team and just such an inspiration to, to everyone just how hard and you know he kind of just puts his head down and, and does the work um but yeah i think him being in the midfield again um our partnership has really really grown in in the last couple of games in the in the last couple of months since since we've been able to play together um so i think having him back um healthy and and ready to go is is really key for our team um you know he he has a lot of sacrifice for the team, and, and it's really important in, in the way that we play that that we have him in, in the field. Yeah, I mean, here's Jackson Ewell chatting about uh, Judson and his just uh, fantastic ability as a defensive central midfield player. And I, I, I think a lot of people take for granted the defensive midfield position or yet don't totally understand the position um, and, and, and what it is and what it does. Um, but, uh, Judson for me is one of the top defensive central midfield players in the league. Um, and the quakes also, uh, you know, have a surprise player in, in Judson. It was a really good deal of business that they were able to, to, to get him on loan and then be able to, to, to get him permanently, um, for, for this year. And as you guys know, I'm, I'm a huge fan of, of watching him play. Um, and, and if you have, uh, you know, youngsters, uh, at home, 
you could just watch Judson play uh, and track him and track his movements and see what he does well, protecting that back four, being the first guy through central midfield to be able to make that tackle um, on someone coming through and, and helping out uh, his defense. And then being that um, connector between the back line and midfield um, and to the wingers and to the attack. Um, and he always wants to get on the ball. He's eager. And he's done such a great job. Um, and our colleague, uh, Colin Etnier, who did a really nice piece on the Quakes Epicenter um, that that uh, Jamin is the editor-in-chief, uh, ha had a really nice bit uh, on Judson and his statistics and why he's in that position and what he brings. Uh, but, but Jamin, how has Judson been able to make a player like Jackson and Magnus Eriksson just uh, go in this team? And, and and let's back it up. There's a two-part question. His the Quakes were without him for the first two matches of the season and 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 had to settle for that draw with the Alanis um stoppage time free kick. But 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 let's be fair here. Judson uh, is a, a, a top player in this side and should be one of the first names on the team sheet. Yeah, seven goals, two games to start the season, no Judson. Um and uh and of course we we also threw flow into those types of conversations. I think that's also an element of it as well, particularly on the set piece marking. But uh, when it comes to the run of play, you know, Judson and Colin did a great job in his article, had, had a couple charts in there that I helped him with. Um, there was, you know, it shows where those defensive actions are at. And, and I remember the very, everyone's going, who's Judson? Who's this guy, right? Judson, <laughs> I had no idea how to say his name at the time. But everyone's going, who is this guy? And when I pulled up the 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 videos on the um, the uh, scouting service, I have access to what I saw was how fast he went line to line, and almost you know just seeing about three minutes of his defensive work, I knew that the reason he was being brought into this team was to deal with the counterattack issues from 2018. And you see it again in this tournament when you see where those defensive actions are at. They're not really in the center of the pitch. They are on the sides and they are up. And what they're counting on is Jackson Ewell and Magnus Eriksson putting in the work uh, in the center of the pitch a little bit higher up and allowing Judson to roam sideline to sideline to be able to stop uh, the attacks coming down the wings, uh, particularly uh, anything with, with some acceleration and pace, right? And uh, that's where he really excels is shutting down those types of counterattacks. He gives that cover to everybody. As Jackson said, it allows me to get higher up the pitch. And when we took a look at the average player position, Colin and I did uh, for his article, it was really obvious very quickly uh, that Jackson Ewell had moved about 10 yards further up the pitch on average. Um, and, and Magnus Eriksson had as well. Um, because he was also having to play a bit deeper. And, you know, that was a really important change in how the passing map happened because now those passes are happening in front of the 18 and in that space between the 18 and and the uh, the center circle. And uh, instead, Jackson's passes were all happening back behind the center circle before. And that was a, that's a big that's a big difference because you're already starting really 10 yards further up the field, particularly, uh, when they're able to win the balls uh, higher as well, which is also happening. And it's a completely different team. I mean, you can't say enough about the work that Judson uh, gives. I, I think our uh, our comments here in the chat from Jesus and Akash are both, both uh, you know, dead on. Um, you know, Judson being the most important player in our lineup and, and being the MVP of the tournament, at least for the Earthquakes, um, you know, the work that that he's putting in, getting getting uh, up and down and sideline to sideline, you know, and uh, and really being able to do it for at least seventy minutes in that kind of humidity and heat is, you can't say enough about it. Yeah, Jamin, I I absolutely agree with Akash. He's definitely the MVP of the Earthquakes team in this tournament. And if the Quakes mount a, a challenge for the the title, then I think he could be uh, an underrated pick for for the MVP of the entire tournament, if the Quakes can can win it all. Uh, and, and one stat that you mentioned last week, Jamin, that I think it's just uh, blows my mind about Judson is that uh, on Twitter, somebody had tracked the, the speed at which he ran when he recovered uh, for his recovery run, when he gave up the ball against Vancouver for, 
for the goal on which San Jose went behind. It was 100 meters in 10.98 seconds, which is just absurd that he's putting in those sorts of efforts uh, again and again and again. Uh, and, and not just his work rate, but uh, his his tactical uh, his, his tactical mindset to be able to be in the right place at the right time defensively is just outstanding. He's he's absolutely the the glue that binds this team. The big glue, uh, Judson, um, and uh, I think a, we, a new nickname for him, the big glue. Yeah, yeah kind of weird. From uh, no Judson, no party to the big glue. Uh, anyway, we could probably talk about him for for a, for a while, but I, I really do mean it when 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 saying you know you 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 could you know uh, make your make your kids or make youth soccer players watch him and watch his movements because what he does and the way that he does it in that position, such a good specialist um, as well. Um, all right. So um, the Quakes, they play against RSL tomorrow evening uh, coming up at 5.30 p.m. Pacific time on Fox Sports 1. Let's take a look at the tournament bracket just to give us a little teaser here. Uh, so tomorrow, 8.30 Eastern, 5.30 Pacific, uh, a.k.a. our time. And then they will take on the winner of Columbus and Minnesota, um, potentially, if they are able to get through, if if they're able to get through. Um, NYCFC already winning earlier this evening, three goals to one against Toronto FC, one of the finalists, the Eastern Conference champion from last year. Um, but this table is starting to, 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 uh, to look uh, – quite interesting. Um, but let's, um, let's hear from, uh, Jackson Ewell on the matchup with Real Salt Lake and breaking down Real Salt Lake, which is something that I want to talk to you guys about after we hear from Jackson. Um, I mean, I think, I think they're a very, very challenging opponent and, um, we're going to have to be, we're going to have to be ready for, for the quality that they have. Um, you know, they have, um, a lot of dangerous players who can who can hurt us, and um, they're a very good structured team. So I think um, you know we're gonna have to go in with with the right game plan, um, knowing that that is that it's a knockout stage, and um, I think it's it's a good opportunity to to keep growing as a group within ourselves. And um, I think we're just gonna have to try to play um, our style of soccer, and um, hopefully it leads to the best. Yeah, I think, um, you know, like I said, they're a very structured team and, and they have a lot of good players, especially um, in the back. Um, so I think it'll be it'll be challenging for us to find good spaces and, uh, you know, kind of exploit um, their defense as much as possible. Um, but, you know, we we wanted to be aggressive in, in the group stage games and, and try to score goals. And, and that meant with Judson coming back that I was able to step up a little bit higher and, and kind of get into the box and the attacking area a little bit more. And so I think um, with this game plan, um, we're going to try to stay as true to our, ourselves as possible, um, you know, while adjusting some tactical things to try to, to, try to um, exploit their defense as much as possible. So, um, I think we're just going to try to play our game and, and hopefully we can we can score goals. Yeah, Salt Lake's a team that won their first game, then tied and then lost going into the round of 16. But they were the best third place team out of the third place finishers um, in, in what MLS calls the wild card um, on that side. I just I. Um, I I kind of wanted to 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 bring this to you guys because Salt Lake is this juggernaut team that potentially could be a bogey team for San Jose, but then at the same time they've always played the the Quakes um, quite close. Uh, last year the Quakes losing in Salt Lake and then at home needing a stoppage time winner from 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 Danny Hooson. So um, earlier in the show we talked about Matthias Almeida and his his thoughts on. Um, the matchup, but um, this is going to be uh, uh, an interesting, just uh, Western Conference um, foe that uh, that they're going to have to match up against one another. Um, Jamin, where do you see this going? Well, I, I think it's going to be probably more of the same. Um, like I said before, if you take a look at the expected goals on the two games from last season, which were both one zero affairs. Um, the uh, the quakes were under one, uh, like eighty, I think like 0. 0.83 
0.85, something like that. To, it was very close. The two games were about the same, whereas RSL was was more like a, a 1.05, 1 1.1 uh, on both games. It, you know, they were almost like mirror copies of each other, except uh, you know, one was home and the Quicks were able to get uh, get get the goal. Um, and and you know on the road they weren't able to so you, you're not going to expect a lot different now uh, one of the things that RSL has kind of shown in this tournament though is they're just not they're just not functioning as an offensive unit now of course that can change at any given time and and you know I don't want to jinx jinx anything here but like I said before they've only given up three goals but they've only scored three goals as well. Um, you, they they're missing something from their offensive component. Now we we've heard that Krylock uh, might be uh, a bit injured, working his way back from injury. Doesn't quite have the mobility that he had last season. You know, I don't know how how true or not true that is. Sometimes those things are are put out there in order to to um, just just set you know whatever storyline people want to want to put around things. Um, the other thing that uh, happened uh, in in uh, the previous RSL games is we've seen how much uh, Corey Bear is really trying to take on. Uh, people with his dribbles, and he actually hasn't been very successful. Um, he seems like he is not uh, not firing on all cylinders right now. Um, you know, someone like Judson or uh, someone like um, uh, you know the outside backs uh, should be able to to stop him. Uh, the quicks should be able to. They've been very one dimensional with the offense. It should make it fairly simple to be able to to shut them down unless there's some new component they're going to be able to throw on for this game. This this one could come down to penalties, guys. You know, uh, you know it, it's um, you know, and I, you know, I don't know how well that favors the Quakes. I mean, I have in mind who I think could probably take penalties, but I'm not going to be shocked if this is zero zero or one one heading to penalties. Absolutely, Jim. And look, R RSL weren't inspiring in the group stages. They beat Colorado two 0 tied Minnesota, lost to Sporting Kansas City. But RSL aren't really an inspiring team generally. They play, they play a very organized, very defensive style. They like to sit deep, absorb pressure. So the impetus will definitely be on the Quakes to try to break them down. Uh, as you say, Jamin, I expect it will be a KG affair like San Jose's game against Seattle. It will come down to Vaco uh, and Erickson and, and Rios' ability to create chances in those tight spaces and break down RSL. They weren't able to do that against Seattle. So I'm curious about what your, your potential pen penalty lineup is. Uh, would be if if it comes to that situation. That that's a that's a great on the spot question that we did not plan for, Alex. Thank you very much. Uh, well, I'd love to see what the fans have to think think in the chat. But but let's talk about the obvious PK takers very quickly. It's going to be you know Wando. You want to have Wando on the pitch at the end so that he can take penalties, right? It's going to be Magnus. Magnus is a perfect. I think it's four for four since he joined the Quakes. Um, and we also know that Alanis is a fantastic penalty taker as well. Um, so those three for sure. Beyond that, could be some debate, you know? We I mean, I don't think your DP's not taking a penalty. Let's yeah. be honest. I mean, I mean, Christian Espinosa is taking a penalty. Christian Espinosa should be able to take a penalty. Has he taken one for the Quakes yet? Maybe, did he take one last season? I think so. Did he? Maybe, maybe not. Okay, I don't remember now. Um, Maybe maybe someone can chime in if they re recall. Uh, there might have been a situation where he did. Maybe if if uh, both um, Magnus and, and um, Wanda were off. Um, so yeah, yeah, I, I can see that. I can see Christian Espinosa taking one. Vaco, you know, potentially is another one. Jackson Ewell uh, potentially yeah. could take one as well. I think all those guys are are options. Um, you know, too bad. You know, you don't have Victor Bernardes to to crush one. Um, you know, but um, you know. That, that's a, that's a, that's a different time, and, and the Quakes will be prepared even during the regular season. At the end of practice, they very often practice their penalties. Uh, Chris Wondolowski almost always buries his. Uh, we, we can confirm that from having been at, at, at the Quakes training. Uh, but yeah, they, they they will be prepared, and I have no doubt that that they will have. Matias Almeida will have will have a list uh, of names ready to choose from. Absolutely. And, and, and ideally structure his um, lineup in a way that if he thinks it's going to go to penalties, he's got the right players on the pitch. I mean, the, to be honest, he's been taking, uh, you know, Christian Espinoza off before, 
before 90 minutes uh, in each of the games, uh, I think trying to save him. At this point, is there anything to save him for? You know, so you have to decide if you're going to take him off if, because you probably want him available for PKs. Just for the record, 90 minutes and then right to PKs if it is tied um, after that. No extra time. Um, so you got to keep those players on the, the pitch within 90 minutes. Um, a little different um, than going to extra time and then going directly to penalties for those of you that are um, – tuning in uh, let's just roll this clip of um jackson Ewell talking about potentially having to go to penalties yeah i mean i think we're um you know definitely aware of of that circumstance and um, of course we want to go into each game hoping to to win in in the 90th 90 minutes or the 90 minute plus um but of course it's it's a probability that it's going to happen and or it could happen and, you know, we've kind of taken into trainings, you know, having extra time to to kind of um, improve on on those situations in case they happen and kind of having a game plan of, you know, who needs to be on the field and, and what what needs to be taken into consideration, um, you know, if if a draw is, occurs. And so I think, um, you know, there'll be a little bit of strategy from all the teams. Um, during the next couple of games and the next couple of rounds, and we we'll definitely have that in the back of our mind. So there you got it. Uh, the box-to-box -box central midfield sensation, Jackson Ewell, uh, saying that uh, it's on the mind. Uh, they think about it a little bit. I, I think what's interesting for me when you, when you get to penalties is it's also on the manager to kind of know a little bit about – how the player has performed throughout the game or what mindset the player is in um, before picking somebody automatically as well. Um, I don't think it's just who are the best players and who takes them. I also think there's a little bit of a strategy on, on that. I think that with Matias Almeida, he's such a, um, uh, a warm, personable person with his players, uh, such a man manager. He, I think he he potentially could have an X factor in 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 the cards uh, if it were to go to penalties, uh, and I I think that that would show. I think that that would show. Um, I think that there's so many different ways of going about it, or throwing on a different keeper, or whatever with penalties, or throwing on all these other players that are good at taking penalties. But um, everyone's got their own strategy. Um, I don't want to give away mine. Anyway, um, with that, being said, I would just add that uh, if if Matias Almeida could uh, could take a penalty, could jump in, put on his boots, and take a penalty, I would absolutely yeah. trust Matias. Totally, or, or or a couple other people on his coaching staff, right? Uh, well, the good news is uh, the Quicks can't get Concacaf here and have to face Toluca in penalties, so there's that. <laughs> All right. Um, we are nearing the end of our program for this evening. Just wanted to shout out to everybody that has been tuning into our program um, tonight. We so much appreciate the support. Um, it really does mean uh, uh, the world to us um, to tuning in uh, week in, week out, um, you know, asking us questions on Twitter, asking us questions here in the chat, uh, building your community. That's what we are all about. We don't just go here and want to throw up stats and just start talking about football and that thing. We want to have this be a community as well. And we have the chance to attend the Quakes Twitter community Um uh, get together happy hour the other night um, that was hosted uh, by uh, Paul Dewhurst uh, of the San Jose Earthquakes, who runs the social media channels. Um, here's uh, some pictures of of everybody uh, tuning in, and this is what it's all about. It really is. This is what uh, football, soccer, uh, fuchi ball, football, whatever you want to call it. This is what it is all about. And sometimes we forget about that. And Alex Morgan last week, um, you know, we were chatting about John Lewis and his impact on society um, in our country and, and, and you saying that um, soccer is, has really brought us again back together um, despite everything that's been going on with COVID and this horrendous um, um, pandemic. Um, that right there is, is, is really what our show is about. That is in our ethos and, and that's what we're that's what we're all about. Um, and Jesus Solorio, I do salute you. You've been 
you have been ch chatting this thing up the last few episodes, but you said what a beautiful fan base, and I agree. I agree. I I, I couldn't agree even more. Um, you know, it it, it has uh, all sections of of the football community from all over, um, and um, you know, as a, as a group, as a team here, um, as Black and Azul, um, we are proud to be a part of the the Quakes community um, online and with you guys too. Just another little note, uh, Joel Soria was going to join us this evening. He um, had a little bit of an accident on a biking um, trip that he took earlier today. He is doing okay. He is fine. Um, I'm sure he would like for you guys to reach out to him as well. Um, the team has reached out to him. We talk to him all the time. Um, uh, he hasn't been able to join up with us um, with these episodes um, because he hasn't just been comfortable uh, yet being able to do so um, with everything that's been going on. But we do um, keep obviously in close contact with all of our team members. Um, this, this team, um, it relies on everybody um, to, to, to do their part. And we miss Joel uh, very, very much, um, but he is doing okay. He will join us for future episodes um, for sure. Um, uh, but, um, not with us tonight, but please send him your regards, um, as well. Um, and he is doing okay. All right. I'm talking too much, obviously. And, um, let's go ahead and, uh, and get into, uh, the chat a little bit. Um, Akash Saxena, he says with Erickson, Vako, Husen, all on expiring contracts, we most likely won't get any money from the transfer market. Any thoughts whether the replacements will be in-house or from outside? I think they're going to be from the outside. I, I think the only uh, in-house replacement that I can picture is that uh, Cade Cowell, if he has another fantastic offseason, if he shows as much growth, as he has this last year, that he could actually be a replacement for Danny Hoosen up front. So that's the only the only replacement in house I can imagine for uh, a, a number ten and for more attacking options. I think that the Quakes will have to go um, to the transfer market. I mean, I would I actually think they're going to do what they've done so far, which is put him on the wing. So I see him as more of a replacement for Vaco on the left. Um, part of it may depend on also what uh, what Shea Salinas' situation is. If um, if he's uh, you know for sure going to be going going at least another year or so, um, but I, but I agree you know that Kate Cowell is probably the most likely to to come in and take one of those spots. And uh, what I'm expecting is is that um, you know they're going to be they're looking in South America. You know they're going to look in in Mexico if, if there's a value opportunity there. Or maybe maybe a DP situation that uh, that the front office is is up for, um, and try to identify talent out of there that can come right in. Uh, they know Matias Almeida well; can work within his system. I think it, you know, so long as Almeida is here, my my guess is that they'll probably be doing less out of Europe and and more out of uh, Central America. Let's talk about the center back combination a little bit here. Um, with Osvaldo Alanis uh, not playing in the last match. Um, Emmanuel um, had written to us and said, Alanis didn't play the last match and the Quakes looked great at the back. Um, I would like Alanis with Flo as center back and wonder what Almeida will choose uh, for tomorrow. And I'm going to partner this question with um, the quote unquote kind of lineup question. Um, that was from Jesus Solorio. Yes, of course. Jesus Solorio. Great question. Um, Emmanuel, also very good question. Let's start with the center back pairing. Um, does he keep it the same or does Alanis come back in the team? I think Alanis has to come back in the team. Yeah. Yeah. Alanis is back almost hundred percent. Last, last game was giving him the opportunity to kind of work through some of the cramping and things that he had had going on before, bring him in for, uh, for the knockout stages and full health, you know, there's no question Alanis is back in the lineup, and I don't believe that this is going to be the situation where uh, he's going to decide to to play flow over Kashia. I think at this point with with Judson back, the team has shown that they can, uh, you know, when they're not committing their own errors, um, the expected goals on all three games was below one for the Quakes opponents. I, I don't think Alameda is going to really change anything. I think it's going to look very much like his 
uh, lineup that he he threw out there, you know, for the first two games. Um, obviously, Danny Danny Hudson wasn't available uh, in the first game, but uh, but he's not he's he's unlikely to start. It's gonna he'll probably stay Rios up top. So I really don't see any squad rotation changes necessary here. They've had a whole week, unless there's some sort of knock in practice, you know, or in the pregame that we can't don't really know about or can't expect. Um, he's gonna stick with the same lineup. I, I absolutely agree, Jamin. Uh, I think it'll be Alanis back in that position. Flo has played well. He's played well in these last two games, but I think he's definitely more liable to making errors. And for what we expect to be such a, a tight, cagey affair, uh, I, I would trust Alan East more in that situation. And look, Flo is a great option off the bench. He brings a ton of spirit. He brings a ton of energy. If the Quakes find themselves in this situation where they're down a man, or if they need to hold on to the lead, if they need an extra push to hold on to a lead late on, he's a really versatile player. And he can slot it anywhere. I think he's the perfect substitute in the defense. All right. Uh, Quakes tomorrow. Um, they play against Real Salt Lake. 5.30 p.m. kickoff. So if you're not feeling your Monday, you're going to turn on that television or you're going to turn on your YouTube TV or Hulu TV or whatever you get FS1 with or whatever package you have. Um, and you're going to pour yourself a cocktail or a beer or a nice tea or an iced tea or a boba tea or whatever, and you're going to watch um, this uh, match tomorrow um, with the Quakes against Real Salt Lake. Um, Jeff Vikos wanted to shout you out. Um, we've got a cake for episode 50. We've got to get you a cake for episode 50. Not yet. Maybe some cupcakes. Let's make it to episode 50. Episode 50 would basically be if the Quakes continued to do their thing in this tournament, um, and that would be very, very quickly. So um, I don't know what kind of connections you have with the cupcake companies um, or, or, or whatnot or what kind of, um, you know, black and blue sprinkled, you know, cupcakes you want to send. But we will gladly take that, and we appreciate you um, uh tuning in as well. And of course, before we leave for this evening, want to get everybody's um, final thoughts. I'm going to start with you, Alex Morgan, because I know you're low on computer battery over there. Yeah, I, I, I'm excited for this game. This is, I think, only going to be the second knockout game that I've ever gotten to watch the, the San Jose Earthquakes play in my, my time covering them as a reporter. Uh, and and we, we don't speak of the last one. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I, I, I'm I'm super excited for this game, and if the Quakes can continue far in this tournament, I think, as you say, Charles, episode 50 would probably align right around the finals. So um, the only thing is in in my head that I'm trying to think of is what flavor of cupcake would match with black and blue. Because if it was if if, if the Quakes were red uh, or another color, I could see like a red velvet get involved, but I'm trying to think if there's like a blueberry cupcake uh, option. We, we have to brainstorm that one and, and we'll get back to you guys in the chat. Yeah. And um, the, uh, the I, I also open cup, right? We don't count open cup for knockout games anymore. I don't, you know, I don't know. There was a, actually a comment. I think Akasha corrected us. He did say that Espinosa did take a penalty against Sac Republic in the open cup. So let me tie, uh, tie those two things together. Uh, right there. Uh, also, um, I think uh, Football Monkey uh, Vega shows up and uh, uh, to talk about Magnus, and uh, we did cover that earlier in the show, so you may want to rewind later on for that. But um, yeah, I, I think we we kind of know what to expect with RSL. It's not going to be the most exciting affair. What could make the game really interesting is if one of the teams can really jump out to an early advantage. That's something we haven't really seen uh, with the, the two teams in their current uh, configuration happen yet. Uh, so if someone gets a, an early advantage off of a set piece or something along those lines, particularly if anyone can go up 2-0, we could get a wide open game that we're not expecting. But, uh, you know, other than that, I, th I think we got a good idea, you know, how things are going to go. But, hey, you know, it is knockout round play. Uh, it is exciting. We've already seen uh, a little bit of upset uh, stuff going on with NYCFC, you know, winning tonight uh, over Toronto. And, um, you know, it'll be interesting to see kind of uh, what happens from here. 
Thank you, Jamin. Uh, much appreciated. Um, want to thank all of our fans and make sure that you please share the episode on social media uh, for all your fellow fans. So if you're having a, a not fun Monday, which is a common thing, um, we appreciate you uh, coming to watch and sharing our content and uh, listening to uh, to our show here or tuning in on the podcast um, as well. Uh, Jamin, Alex, I agree with you. I think this game will be similar to the Chicago game in, in, in a way. It'll be KG. Um, it'll be somewhat defensive. Um, and um, uh, I do expect the Quakes to, to get a result here and for Matias Almeida to get his team into what would be the quarterfinal uh, to take on a Minnesota or Columbus uh, side. Um, but the Quakes have have been so much fun to watch and 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 also cover during this time. Um, such a fun team, and and we heard in the the Quakes uh, Twitter hangout um, uh, with with the rest of the fans uh, that some of their uh, personnel that work in their front office that have just been getting compliments. You guys are just so much fun, and you can see that from um, the social media stuff that they've been pushing out and. To be fair, if you're in a tournament or in a kind of a World Cup type of setting like this, that's the way to go. That's the way to hang. And so, um, you know, why wouldn't you want your team in your own backyard that you root for uh, just having so much fun? So um, just wanted to wrap this show up um, and um, say thanks once again. Uh, Joel Soria, not with us uh, tonight. Uh, Lemon with the uh, yellow shorts. Thank you, Diane. Uh, for that, <laughs> for that feedback, um, Alex Morgan here with us, Jamin Moore um, here with us. Please reach out um, uh, during this challenging time, during this tough time, to us on Twitter. Um, we would love to to chat with you um, at any time, as well as Joel, um, as well for Aaron Scholl, our associate producer, but for our executive producer and director, Jason Scholl. This is Black and Asul. Uh, make sure you like, follow, share our work. Um, thank you so very much. We will see you for our next show, episode number 46, really soon. Stay safe, everybody, and enjoy the match tomorrow. Good night.